Amen and amen. In the name of Jesus, I bring you greetings today from the rest of your Texas Baptist family. 5,300 churches across the state who partner together voluntarily to bring the kingdom of God to earth here in the state of Texas and beyond. Bring you greetings and give you thanks as well. Thank you for your faithful giving through the cooperative program. Thank you for sharing Brother Miguel with us through the executive board and his leadership and his wisdom there. Uh, and for the enthusiasm and excitement that he's brought to you as well as to us. We're glad to be family with you. The Missions Foundation exists to connect God's mission and your legacy. Not just the legacy of other Texas Baptists, but your legacy. How will God use the practical, real stuff of your life for you to make an impact for his kingdom? I have a question for you this morning. I want you to complete this sentence. Where there's a will... Where there's a will, y'all are all over the place. Where there's a will, there's a way. Yes, definitely there is, isn't there? Some folks would say, where there's a will, you're about to meet a lot of new relatives. Perhaps what they have in mind is that vision you've seen in a television show or movie, perhaps, that, that scene where Behind the big mahogany desk, the attorney sits and moves his half glasses down to the very tip of his nose, <clears throat> and he clears his throat and lifts a document, and the leather-bound books and the mahogany bookshelves behind him just seem to be coming towards you. And nervously, you look around the room, and you see your family, and then you see a lot of other people that somehow have your same last name, and you've never met them before. They've come from Oklahoma and Arkansas. What are they even doing here? for the reading of the will. Hmm. Sometimes that's the way it works, isn't it? Our friend, Dr. Gary Cook, the chancellor of Dallas Baptist University, always said it this way, where there's a will, get in it. Dr. Cook did an incredible job of helping God's people use their resources to bring Dallas Baptist University to the pinnacle, I think, of Christian higher education. We're so glad to be partnering with them and to live in the same city as they do, aren't don't we? It's a good thing for all of us. It makes such a difference. Where there's a will, get in it. Well, how do you actually go about getting in a will? It requires certain things. First one of those is a relationship. I hate to break it to you, but no one is going to leave you anything unless you have some type of relationship with them. They do need to know your name. That would be important. But... It's really good to get born into the right family. Some people earn their money the old-fashioned way. They inherit it. And they were smarter than I am. They somehow found their way to get born into a family that had all kinds of resource to be passed on. That wasn't my experience. Maybe it was or wasn't yours. But a relationship is all important, isn't it? For you to get in a will, it takes something else besides that. It takes resources. Resources that can be passed on. I mean, if there are no resources, worse yet, if it's only debt, then do you really want to be in that will? Probably not. Resources are a vital part of a will going into effect. Third thing that it takes for a will to go into effect is a written record. In the state of Texas, it has to be witnessed and notarized for it to be easily taken care of, for it to be easily uh, uh, probated. A will, a written record. Well, my family knows what I need. Well, they probably do know what you need. Do they know what you want to give to them? They all have a different understanding of that, don't they? A written record is what makes that clear, what makes it legal. Here's the bad news. For a will to go into effect, somebody's got to die. Now, don't be pointing any fingers, okay? That's not what this is about. For a will to go into effect, somebody has to die. Until it does, it's a really nice idea, but once a death occurs, then that person's will includes the instructions that they left in their lifetime for all the possessions and all the relationships that they have. The fifth thing that, that's required for a will to go into effect is an executor. Now, that's not an executioner who hastens the death and makes it happen more quickly. That, that's not what that's about at all. It's an executor. It's the person who carries out the instructions in the will. 
They're not the decision makers. They're not saying, well, I think I do this and that. No, they're doing exactly what the will declares. And they're a very important person because they're the ones who actually make it happen in real life. So that's what it takes to get in a will. And you're sitting there scratching your head. Brother Miguel's going, what in the world does this have to do with church? Where is Jesus in any of this stuff? And, and what does this have to do with God's work and God's mission and my legacy? Well, listen to what Jesus said. You might find this familiar. Right in the middle of the great sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, if you were to fold it, this would be in the crease. Jesus tells his closest family, his followers, his disciples, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Your will be done. Years later, the Apostle John, who heard those words as Jesus taught us how to pray, would write these words to a church in a world that was going the opposite direction from the cross of Christ. He writes this. The world and its desires pass away, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. Have you read those words before? Sometimes they get nestled in the creases, I think, of John's letters. This world and its desires, everything that we see, everything that we hold on to, everything we long for, everything we strive to achieve, everything we covet, everything we lust after, it's dying. It's passing away. And we know that this world is going to pass away, isn't it? But the one who does what? The will of God lives forever. So God has a will. We're to pray that his will would be done in us and in our world, as it already is in heaven, that it would happen here on earth. God has a will. And it's what's going to help us to live forever. And it's what draws the line between where we'll spend eternity. God has a will. Are you in it? What does it take to be in God's will? It takes the same things that it takes to be in a will today. God's will is his way to provide for his family. That's what his will is. That's what God wants. He wants to provide for his family, those who have a relationship with him. God's will is his way to preserve and pass on his blessings. Everything that God has entrusted to us, he still has a purpose for, and he still has an intent about. God's will is his way to perpetuate his purpose for the future, his kingdom purpose. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. That's what God's will is intended to do. That's what he wants. So what does it take for you and me to get in God's will? Of course, it begins with a relationship, doesn't it? John's gospel begins by describing Jesus, one with the Father, preexistent before creation, the agent of all creation. And he says this, he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Children born not by the will of man, but of God, by a relationship. In Romans chapter 8, Scripture says that those who are led by the Holy Spirit are the sons and daughters of God. They are joint heirs with Christ. They are the heirs of God, the recipients of God's eternal inheritance. It requires a relationship. And before we go any further, before another slide advances, or before you clear your throat again, or before you go, I wonder how much longer it's going to go, you need to hear this. Without that relationship, you, along with the rest of this world, are passing away apart from him. The one who does the will of God 
the one who does what God wants, the one who receives his son as Savior and Lord, the one who's led by his spirit, the one who receives his inheritance and his blessing will live forever. You don't have that relationship with God, get it right now. Simply bow in your heart of hearts and say, Lord Jesus, save me. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's all that it takes. That relationship is the most important thing we'll talk about this day, this year, this lifetime. And you need it. And it's available to you right now. What does it take to get in God's will? That relationship is definitely required. It also takes resources, not yours, but God's, which happen to be one and the same when you come to think about it. When Jesus taught us to pray. He said it, give us this day our daily bread. And that strikes us a little bit odd, doesn't it? That he goes from the grandeurs of God, whose name is holy and who presence is in heaven. And he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Wow. Our daily bread. Those listening, as he preached that Sermon on the Mount, would have understood those words, daily bread, as straight from the book of Exodus. The account of God leading his people, redeeming them, creating his people out of those who were not a people before, calling them to himself, daily bread. The children of Israel making their way from Egypt to the land of promise, God's kingdom promise for them, got hungry. And they needed provision. And God said, I'll provide. And they said, how will you provide? We want to go back. We, we still love the taste of the onions and the garlic. We, we want to go back to the spicy food that we learned to eat while we were there. Feed us. We're hungry. We're starving. We need you, God. He said, I'll provide. Tomorrow morning, your provision will be there. They woke up the next morning, and there on the breakfast plates, there was nothing. And God said, you got to go get it. You got to step out of the tent. You got to go. All you have to do is pick it up. And they're stuck on every branch of every bush throughout the wilderness was this sticky stuff. Somebody reached out and Tasted it as good. What is it? Do you know that's what the word manna actually means? What is it? It's not what you want to say when you sit down at your mom's table for lunch, okay? Give her a minute. She'll tell you what it is if you're not so sure. But manna, what is it? Well, it was God's provision. God's provision. That's how intimate a relationship he wants to have with us. That we can count on him for what we need day in and day out. And he does it through his provision. But remember the breakfast plate was empty? God provides. And he gives us the gift of being able to acquire what he has provided. The gift of acquiring wealth is a gift from God. Donald Trump didn't think it up. It didn't come from the richest men in the world. It came from the one who created everything and who's never once relinquished ownership of any of it, who invites his children to call on him for daily bread, daily bread. And the opportunity that you and I have to acquire wealth, to earn a living, to provide for our families, and to pass on blessings, to perpetuate God's kingdom, is a gift from God as well. There's more in daily bread. There's more in the idea of manna, as we see it there in the book of Exodus. There were some interesting folks who, after a few days of going out and picking up God's provision, acquiring it and sharing it with their family and making sure everyone was cared for and nourished, they decided, you know, if we gather up enough of this stuff, we could probably not have to do it every day. And we could probably sell some of it. And, and God said, not so fast. They gave it a try. So on one day, a number of them went out and they gathered enough for not only today, but for the next few days, maybe the next few weeks. You know what happened the next morning when they woke up? The breakfast plate was still empty, but there was an odor, an aroma, a stank, if you would. And they said, what is it again? <laughs> well, it was the manna that didn't keep for a second day. It was daily bread. It was only good for that day. But on the day before Sabbath, 
on the day before the holy day that the holy God wanted to meet with his holy people and didn't want them distracted by having to go out and acquire his provision that day. He said, on the day before Sabbath, you can gather two days worth because that day belongs to me. And I'll even go so far as to make it possible for you to avoid having to acquire that day. What a gift from God. Not only is the gift of acquiring wealth a gift from God, but the gift of accumulating wealth is also a gift from God. Some of you said, I've tried that. My piggy bank's got a hole in the bottom, it seems. I I can't seem to acquire some things, and then I can't seem to accumulate anything. Well, God has a purpose in that too. Maybe trying to get your attention. He may be trying to set your heart on something more than what you've been grasping and seeking after. The resources that God provides, according to Ephesians chapter 1, is every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. And he says that the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 1, uh, 13 is the guarantee of God's inheritance already for us. Eternal life, that's a pretty good inheritance, isn't it? His provision, those who do the will of God live forever. Not just theoretical, not just spiritual, but real blessings. The opportunity to acquire wealth, the opportunity to accumulate wealth, it's all his, folks. There may be some self-made people in the room as far as you think of yourself. The truth of the matter is you walk on his dirt, you breathe his air, and you drink his water. It's his. And one day, it'll be his again. No matter how many times you've written your name on it, it's his. What does it take to get in God's will? It takes a relationship with him. It takes resources. And it takes a written record. A written record. We might say a last will and testament. There's that long word, isn't it? Do you know that the words will and testament and covenant are all the same word? A last will and testament. What is God's will? You'll find it in his word. What does God want? You'll find that in his word. What are the instructions that God left? That he had witness, that he had notarized, if you would. They're found in God's word. God's will is there for us. Relationship, resources, a written record, and a death. Hebrews 9.15 says, Christ died once for all, taking away the sins of many. His death is what makes the will of God go into effect. Apart from his death, sin continues to hold on to us. Apart from his death, death itself won't release us. Apart from his death, hell continues to wreak havoc. But for those who are in Christ Jesus, we have power over sin. We live on the other side of death. We avoid hell completely. The death of Jesus was enough for us. It was all that we need. The writer goes on in the book of Hebrews, as he talks about what God has done for us through the death of Christ. He says, for this reason, that Christ died once and for all, for this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, a new testament, a new will, so that those who are called may receive the promised inheritance now that he has died to set them free from sin. Understanding this discussion of God's will and seeing it in this light will change the way you read the book of Hebrews. It really will. I appreciate the comment about free will. That's the company that we partner with to make this happen. It's not a theological position. It's a price point for a legally necessary document, okay? Christ's death makes it possible. Well, if all those other things to get in a human will are also what we need to get in God's will, who then is the executor of God's will? The night that Jesus was betrayed, the night before he laid down his life for us so that God's will could go into effect and we could have a pathway into the very presence of God himself, before we could be included in God's will because of Jesus' death on the cross, He gathered with those close disciples in the upper room, and he told them this, I'm going away, and you can't go with me. I'm coming back, but I'm not going to leave you by yourself. I'm going to ask the Father, and we are going to send you another counselor, just like I've been, except that he will be with you 
and he will live in you. He will guide you into all truth, and he will remind you of everything that I have said. <laughs> you see, God's Holy Spirit is the executor of God's will. He is the one who makes sure that the that codicils of God's will, the decrees of God's word are carried out in our lives. When we decide that he is allowed to work in us, it's as if Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to do according to his good purpose. God is the one who puts his want to in our hearts. God is the one who gives us the ability to make that happen. The truth is, apart from the power of the Holy Spirit in us, we are powerless to do the will of God. We are ignorant to know the will of God. But His Spirit lights up the Word on His page, this written record of His will for us, and we can live it out. We can carry out everything that God wants us to do and everything He wants us to be as we allow Him to work through us to provide for His family, as we allow Him to work through us to preserve and pass on His blessings as we allow him to work through us to perpetuate his kingdom purpose. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That's what it takes to get in God's will. Are you in it? Are you in God's will? There's probably not a more important question at all, except this follow-up question. You've been working your whole life to be in the will of God. You have a relationship with him. You have resources, you recognize that they are actually his, and you're just the steward, the trustee, the, the one who works for him to carry out his purpose with the resource he entrusts to you. You look to his word to know his will. You thank him for the death of Jesus who makes it possible for you to have a relationship with him, and you know that the Holy Spirit's guiding you and leading you. Does God have a place in your will? You read on that little card that two out of every three people who die in Texas, year after year after year, two out of three people who die in Texas have no will whatsoever. No plan in place. Sometimes it's because they think there's a financial barrier. Well, we're taking that away today. It won't be a financial barrier for you. Some people feel like, well, it's complicated, doesn't have to be. It's time-consuming, doesn't have to be. Does God have a place in your will? If you have a will, have you provided for God's family through your will? Have you recognized that the blessings he's entrusted to you are actually his, and he has a purpose in those for you that extends beyond this lifetime? Have you allowed your will, if you have one, to be how you perpetuate God's kingdom purpose for the days ahead. Our goal as Texas Baptist Missions Foundation in making this available to you is one, to eliminate whatever financial barrier might keep you from creating your own will. Not to tell you what to do, but to eliminate the financial barrier that keeps two out of three people from having one. The other purpose is to help folks in our Texas Baptist family to understand that leaving something through your church, through the missions, may well be what God has in mind, but you need to ask him. You need to ask him. Jesus said, when you pray, when you pray, our Father, your will be done. Does God have a place in your will? If you have a will, you need to look at that and see, is God fairly represented, fairly benefited through your will in accordance with the goodness and the blessing that he's poured into your life? If you don't have a will, I guarantee you God's not in it. You see, the state of Texas has a not-so-wonderful plan for you and for all your stuff, as well as your family. It's a tragic thing when someone passes away without a will. Uh, I was telling uh, some of you that I'm a member at First Baptist Church in Garland and was able to share just briefly a, a word about this process and this opportunity with a group of senior adults one Monday afternoon, 250 of them, and I had about five minutes, Pastor Miguel, so I had to talk almost as fast as you do. And there was one fella who was sitting kind of right back there. They were around round tables, 250 people, and, and he was wearing a black suit and a white shirt and a black tie. And he was kind of glaring at me the whole time. 
And I thought, well, I don't remember having a conversation with him, so whatever he's mad about, I guess we'll have to figure it out. But sure enough, he was the first one past the tables when we were through and I was down off the platform where I was standing. Shook out his, stuck out his hand and said, here's my name. I own four funeral homes. And I wish everyone in Texas would do what you're asking them to do because of the disaster and the tragedy that it is when there's no plan in place. Thank you for what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you for not being nearly as mad as you seem to be. <laughs> Does God have a place in your will? Does God, Does God help you make that decision? Your will is your way to provide for your family and to preserve and pass on his blessings to perpetuate God's purpose for the future. The workshop, just a few minutes, is going to simply walk through the process so that you can go home and do it yourself. 30 minutes, an hour, that's really about what it takes. If you have special needs children or very complicated business interests or a blended family, you may need more than this, but this will prepare you as an exercise for when you actually do sit down because you haven't done it yet with an attorney <laughs> and get this squared away. For God to be able to be at work in our hearts and our lives means first that he has to have our hearts and he has to lead our lives. I'd like for us to pray together even as Jesus taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Father God, we thank you for providing for us even when we didn't realize that it was you. Even when we take in credit for all the blessings and the successes and the provision that you have made for us. Father, remind us of our responsibilities before you, but most of all, we declare that you are our King, that you are our Lord. We declare today that we want to do your will. We would ask that your Spirit might lead us, that you would remind us daily of our opportunity to be a blessing to you, to your church, to your work around the world, to one another. Be at work in us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.